my face. It bears some similarity to the face of my father. And his father's face bears some similarity to his face, right? And his father's face also bears some similarity to his father's face. And his father's face bears some similarity to his father's face. But how similar is my face to the face of my great-grandfather? And how similar is my face to my great 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 grandfather? Obviously there's a continuum at work here. The more up we go in generations, the less similar I will be to the person in question, most likely. There are some people that are not part of my family and yet I share more similarities with them than I do with other members of my family. We don't think of families as those absolute categories anymore. The great Habsburg family is an ensemble of angels. And the Bourbon family, they are devils. Most people nowadays would take such generalizations to be foolish to say the least. And yet, when we talk about concepts like art, science, justice, goodness, we still like to think of them in those absolute terms, as if there's some clear-cut boundary, some, um, some absolute essence that makes up what is part of art, part of science, part of something that is just. And that's where Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, introduced a notion that enables us to think of those things in more valid terms. So, without further ado, let's talk about his notion of family resemblance. People have to make judgments to survive, right? This is good, this is bad, this is reasonable, that is not. Theoretical physics is science, astrology is not. Michelangelo's David is art, this Microsoft paint painting that I spent 30 seconds on is not. It's useful to be able to make statements like that, but it seems almost seems like all of those claims beg the question like all right what is good what is art what is science and it almost seems that we have to answer this question ideally we would like to find one condition the essence of being good or the essence of being a science or art that's basically what socrates tried to do when he went around asking questions like what is justice what is good what is duty Socrates' idea was that there's ultimately one property that the thing we label as good have in common. That would be the essence of good. If we call a well-behaved child good and a virtuous man good, they have to have something in common. Everything that we call good has to have something in common. But Socrates never arrived at any such essence, and his dialogues, written by his pupil Plato, almost always end in aporia, the acknowledgement that no one knows the answer. Before Socrates, Wittgenstein often remarked, people went on with their days completely capable of talking about justice, duty, good, and so on. They didn't need a clear definition and the knowledge of essences to engage with such concepts. And all that Socrates' inquiry really did in this view was to confuse people. And people, mainly philosophers, remained confused for two millennia, thinking that they have to provide some clear definition of a concept, an essence, in order to engage with it. Wittgenstein said that his whole philosophy could be summarized with being the opposite of Socrates. His goal is to get rid of confusion and diffuse the fascination that philosophers have with language and its structures. He wants to help the fly out of the bottle.
Through history, language consistently misled thinkers. A tool with which to express ideas, it often ended up influencing those ideas with its accidental grammatical structure. One supposition that always surrounded it was the idea that it logically and um, consistently categorizes the world around us. In analogy with set theories, we imagine concepts to have clear definitions with no borderline cases. We all know that uh, this is a chair, and we all know that this is not a chair, but what about that? And that? And that? For Wittgenstein, concepts are fuzzy, with no clear borderlines and no essence at all. He explains this idea with the concept of game. What is a game? Let's look at a list of games. Kicking a ball into a wall, football, volleyball, tennis, ping pong, poker, solitaire, crosswords, reading out loud, doing a performance, theater play. What do all of those instances of games have in common? Certainly there's some things that football has in common with volleyball, and volleyball with table tennis, and table tennis with poker, and poker with solitaire. But what does football have in common with solitaire? Okay, now, what do all of those instances have in common? Is there one single thing that would describe all of those, excluding the fact that we call them games? For Wittgenstein, language advances through extrapolating existing uses onto new ones. I call a thing X a game, and then I call a thing Y a game, because of a similarity with the thing X. And then I call a thing Z a game, because of a similarity with the thing Y. Even though X and Z don't share this similarity anymore. Because language is alive and organic, it doesn't have a structure of a logical system, where strictly defined categories would form neat sets and subsets. Our concepts are messy and there's no deep logic uh, that would govern their use. There simply isn't an essence of game. Games are games for different reasons. In recent years, developments in cognitive science have provided remarkable evidence in favor of the idea that people actually categorize things with regards to its similarity to some singular exemplar, rather than some general category. Some branches of philosophy concern themselves with defining human endeavors such as science and art. If your government has limited resources, it's good that you make sure that its funds go to proper scientific research and no pseudoscience. Likewise, we want to support real art and not to be scammed by pretentious uh, artists, right? We want to differentiate real science like theoretical physics from pseudoscience like astrology or phrenology and we would like to distinguish the real art like, you know, whatever, <laughs> from uh, things that are not art and only pretend to be art such as my Microsoft Paint painting. The historical approach to this question was to gather all of those instances of art or science and then look what similarity they all share. What is this one defining characteristic of art or science, the essence of the thing. But let's just look at art for example. What would literally all the artworks share in common? What is the defining characteristic of science? What do theoretical physics, uh, geology and um, experimental psychology all have in common? At this point you're probably thinking, yeah, I mean, there's certainly at least one thing that all of the artworks or all of the sciences share in common. All sciences go about analyzing the world systematically and all the artworks were intentionally created by humans. And all games are fun. All of that might be true, but if we define games as being fun, then watching TV, having sex or snorting cocaine count as game as well. If we define science as systematically analyzing the world, then that includes all the pseudosciences like astrology and um, 
phrenology, if we define art as something that was created by humans, that all of the furniture that you have in your household are artworks. But surely that's not what we mean by art. And that's not what we mean with science or games. We want to differentiate those concepts from things that do not fall into that category. Our definition has not only to include all of the instances of a game or art or science, it also has to exclude all of the things that are not. Uh, as we said, we want to define science to differentiate it from pseudoscience. We want to define art to differentiate it from pretentious art. We want to define games to differentiate it from non-games. But just like Socrates' dialogues always end in aporia, so did the demarcation problem in fail to give a um, convincing answer. At least as long as we suppose that there has to be one defining characteristic of each category. But once we adopted a different approach to this problem, once we got rid of the idea of there having to be an essence, then the problem became more approachable. Taking up Wittgenstein's ideas about language, many thinkers have proposed a fuzzy conception of art or science. In that view, there is no singular thing that would define art as being art or science as being science, but rather a list of properties from which only some have to apply to a thing in order for us to legitimately conceptualize it as uh, art or science. Only after we we'll stop idealizing language and take it for what it is, a complex and organic and fuzzy web of associations, only then we'll solve the problems of defining things. There isn't one particular biological trait that I would share with my family and yet it would exclude everyone else that is not part of our family. Our similarity exists in a complex web of resemblances, one that is not reducible to this idea of a biological essence, so to speak. Our similarity exists in a totality of things. Language clearly indicates that the way we conceptualize the world around us isn't that you know, logically ordered as some set theory would propose. Rather, it's fuzzy, it's complex, it's messy. And we have to accept that only then we can truly understand those complex concepts like art, science, philosophy, games, humanity. Thank you everyone for watching this video. If you're interested in philosophy of language, feel free to check out the rest of the playlist or subscribe to the channel for upcoming videos. Yet again, special thanks to Ethan Schreiber for his donation. Your support really means a lot. Have a nice day, everyone.